Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you are already enjoying the sessions from today. May I see some hands of how many founders we have in the room? Wonderful. How about how many investors? Do we have any investors? And one last, how many students? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for coming, and it's my honor to moderate today's panel, Women Shaping the Future of Investing. And you might have seen some of our panelists already on, in some other panels or keynotes, so they've been running around, so thank you so much for coming. And they're all visiting us from the Bay Area today, so thank you especially, all of you, for coming and visiting our beautiful city. In today's sessions, you have heard a lot about venture capital, investment, what VCs are looking for on the entrepreneurial side. What we wanted to discuss and add to the discussion today is uh, investing in women-founded companies and women investors. What does the landscape look like? And according to recent data by PitchBook, actually the data is not looking so I mean, it's looking better than it was the year before. Nearly 25% of all the companies that were funded were uh, female-funded companies. So there's still progress to be done, but it's an upward trend, which I'm very happy to see growing. And despite these numbers, of course, there's still a significant funding gap between male and female founder teams, and along with ongoing challenges. Now, we don't want to make this panel about males and females, but we, we do want to discuss some of the challenges that female founders and investors are facing. So with further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists, and I will ask them to introduce themselves. They have coming from amazing backgrounds. So we have Essie Moari, managing partner from Mighty Cap. Capital, Andrew Agarwal, general partner at Converge, Divya Sudakar, partner at Geodesic Capital, and Eileen Tangal, founder and general partner of Black Opal Ventures. Thank you again so much for being here. So as, as a first question, I would love for you to introduce yourselves to the panel and, um, and how you ended up being in venture capital industry. Let's start with you. All right, great to be here, everyone. And I so love the energy of this conference. It's phenomenal, so congrats to all the producers. S.C. Moadi, I'm the founder, managing partner of Mighty Capital. Mighty Capital is investing at Series A in B2B tech companies. We're just starting to deploy our third fund, which is $100 million. Uh, prior to that, we have invested in companies you may have heard of, like Amplitude, DigitalOcean, Grok, on platform. Uh, some of them are also based here in San Diego, like SegMed, for example. Uh, what's unique about our approach is that we give our portfolio companies access to half a million product managers that essentially becomes the buyer, become the buyers of their technology products. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anshu Agarwal. Um, I am general partner at Converge. Uh, I uh, Converge invest in early stage B2B tech startups. We do pre-seed, seed, and early series A. Uh, I myself, I'm an operator by background. Uh, I've been part of five startups. Uh, all five were acquired by companies, um, Akamai, Juniper, HP, Citrix, and DigitalOcean. So the last company I founded was a serverless computing company, which was Nimbella, which was acquired by DigitalOcean um, in 2021. And I paid my dues to the acquirer. And when I left my acquirer, the, comp the firm that had invested in my company um, asked me to join them as a general partner. So here I am. I'm, I moved to the dark side, hoping to make the dark side lighter. Um, but founder by background, entrepreneur by background, but I've just moved on to the investing side, helping other founders um, through my operational experience. Hi, everyone. I'm Divya Sadakar, a partner at Geodesic Capital. We're a growth stage investor, so really predominantly investing at the Series B and beyond, mostly in B2B enterprise software, uh, but also do some investments in fintech, healthcare, and consumer. Um, so we've invested in companies like Databricks, Figma, Netscope, Vercel, et cetera. 
Um, and our main value proposition is helping companies as they undergo international expansion in Asia, starting with Japan. Um, so we've helped about half our portfolio companies enter that market and expand, hire a team, uh, and really build out their, their strategy in that market. Uh, in terms of my background, I joined Geodesic uh, two years ago. Before that, I was at Intel Capital, Intel's VC arm. And then prior to that, I was at Inkutel, the VC firm for the U.S. intelligence community, which I'm sure Eileen will also mention. We were colleagues there. Um, and I started my career in financial services, so investment banking and then credit investing before eventually transitioning to uh, more growth stage investing. So thank you. nice to meet you all. Hi everyone, my name is Eileen Tanghal, and indeed I am the founder uh, and general partner for Black Opal Ventures. Um, Black Opal invests in C through Series B companies at the collision of tech and healthcare. So we have a 4D strategy, we invest in diagnostics, the care, drug discovery, data and AI. And really our view is that you need to take the technologies that have been developed for the surveillance economy. So, you know, ads being shown to you by Facebook, by the Uber, so you can consume. And we want to take those technologies and really make impact and impact in effect, in our case, starting with healthcare. And that, that's, uh, that's um, Black Oval for you. I can give you my background as to the journey to, to got, get here. So I started, I'm an electrical engineer and computer scientist by training. I went to a small startup at MIT in 1997, and grew from 630 to a hundred and one public, so well, today, so a billion dollar startup. And then I started my venture capital career in 2001, so I've been a VC, few female VCs for 22 years. Um, and I've been a financial VC, a corporate VC, and then a VC for the CIA, or Octavia, before I started my venture capital firm. So the, the first, you know, financing VC in the UK, really doing hard tech VC investment that ends up applied materials in arm. And then, of course, um, Inkintel, which is a not-for-profit VC investing in dual use. Um, people don't realize this, but you know, Inkintel is 700 portfolio companies, going cause, actually. Really taking tech, again, for other, and, and making a difference in the world. And so I wanted to do that with my partner, uh, Dr. Tar Bishop. He started our fund just three years ago with the backing of several large corporates, including Eli Lilly, and just important, and currently our technology companies for uh, a couple of health systems and tech and CEOs. But that's us. I wanted to go back in time and that talk about the days when you first started out, whether it's as an entrepreneur or investor, and let's start with you because you've been a five time founder. And I'm sure every time it kept on getting better or worse, I'm not sure. So can you walk us through some of the challenges to that, not only as an entrepreneur, but also as a female founder? Sure. Well, I want to correct. I've not been a five-time founder. I've been part of five startups. So, so I was an executive as yeah. one of them, and the last one I found it, and I just speak yeah. it up. But over the course of time, there have been so many lessons learned. There have been different cycles, dot com boom, dot com bust, and financial uh, downturn. And so there are lessons learned all throughout. Um, I think the biggest lesson I learned was in the first startup I was at, uh, where um, it was, uh, we went from the dot com boom to bust. And uh, the lesson learned there was like, uh, as a, uh, it, and there's so many founders in this room, cash is kept. There is no substitute for cash. There is no, no matter what you're doing, you've got, you've got to manage cash flow. And that's the first lesson I learned in my first start. Because we didn't even have money to pay for payroll after the first half of the because we were so dependent on dot com. So if, if you, if any of you were there at that time, effects.com, classic example, effects.com had come eight years later, it would be truly, what is truly to buy? So very, very important lesson was cash as king, that's not most of us. Um, second company, uh, which was acquired by Juniper and it was in streaming, the next lesson learned was don't sell to service providers. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long, long time. We did very well. But you know, really, Juniper acquired us, so we had a good, good, uh, good exit, and we were very successful. Uh, but re realized I'm never going to work for service provider. <laughs> the company that sells to service provider just very hard. So it, in these days, it, given that AI is in everything, the span 
to be to be successful, the the, the success time needed is even shorter. Mm. It's uh, it used to be mm, easy for patients. Every, everybody was patient, but now it is. I think you need to show revenue sooner mm. uh, to raise your next round because you're always thinking of when to raise your next round. Always thinking. What, what are the metrics for the next round? It used to be 1 million ARR for the round. Now you can re, uh, raise money with 20, 30 K MRR, but you know, you're raising the first round on promise. The next round is on numbers. So just remember that, that always, always shoot for a um, cash is kingdom. The third company um, had similar lessons, but I would uh, just um, fast forward to the last company that I founded. Uh, which was um, I was uh, pandemic. How many of you had plans for pandemic? <laughs> no, <laughs> and I, I really uh, that time um, I, I had raised a good seed, good seed round of four million. So I was sitting on cash, but we took the founders to fifty percent pay cut. Mm -hmm. Right then, in March of twenty twenty, we decided we are going to take fifty percent pay cut because we didn't know how long it last, and you know it lasted. It was good for tech, but who did you cut that? So those were the lessons learned. The last one was being the CEO and the co being CEO and founder. Its CEO job is the most lonely job. Yeah. Although I'd say the VC job is lonelier than the CEO. But uh, the CEO job is a very lonely job. It's, it ends there. So you have to make all the decisions. I, I think the... Um, just take take it as uh, every day. It was have a plan B for important critical stuff, and those those were my lessons learned. But there are more to be learned. It is so much to share. And to see how back in your journey, as you started out, what several different paths, how has it been for you to just sort of up and learn, just the best. Yes, yeah, so I will say before being an investor for the past ten years, I was an entrepreneur for ten years and. By 12 G year, also by, by trading. Um, I will build on what, what you shared, which I all, all agree with cash is king. It's like not what like trans everything. Uh, I will say speed of execution is right next. And especially now during this like AI boom that we're in, the, you know, what was a innovative and hard to do three months ago is now free and available to everybody on, you know, change or what have you, or it's well big or for Brexit. And so there is a massive competitive advantage for serial entrepreneurs who can play the game with their eyes closed. And it means that the bar for first time founder is extremely high. So that's that's one key thing. And then maybe, um, you know, another advice related to like being aware. Um, our, our policy is to say actions speak louder than words. So we really talk about all the women that make a difference. We want to be known for being great investors, great entrepreneurs. Uh, the one thing that I found is a common thread is that if we're earlier in their career, women have a little bit less confidence. It, it's not like it doesn't mean that it is the way it is. It just means that as a woman, like you want to always remind yourself, you are ready. You are, you know, dead. Dead. It's okay if people say like you're a boss. You just totally disregard that. Nobody's ever going to be happy because you're in the CEO anyways, and whatever decisions you make is the on the other to use. That doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but you are ready and have that sort of real strong confidence that you are amazing is something that I would, uh, yeah, I wish my younger self was a little bit more into. Yeah, to that point, you know, I remember when, when I started out on my journey as an XT9 CEO and sometimes feeling the way it would feel, and I always told my inner voice, stop feeling sorry for yourself, get back on check, you better do this, you better be you know, strong, and like myself, the community of people that would support me and really take that, is an expect to give me that energy. But, um, you know, it's always going to be there in terms of women, then some, it was these big things, they were there, and, you know, we can all work together as a team who is stronger for it. Now, Yuri, I know you started more on the investment side of things. I wanted to ask you about your journey. It was not everybody likes to be an entrepreneur, right? So, how has that been for you in, in this industry? And you are, you know, a younger generation, so I would love to hear your team. Yeah, um, maybe touching a bit also on the 
previous topic of how is it as a female in that spot, right? And so um, 15 years ago, I guess, uh, when I was in investment banking looking at more buy side investor roles, uh, oftentimes I would hear you know things like, oh, that firm already has their female quota. There's one female investor, <laughs> so they're not going to be looking. Don't bother, which is kind of crazy, right? <laughs> like one person and it's a team of like 20 or plus uh, to think that that was their quota. So it's like a diversity hire, which is kind of sad. And so I, I think like since then, I have seen progress where that's no longer the case. And I really don't think anyone would say that team blatantly anymore. If they do, like, <laughs> uh, there's something wrong with them. But uh, that was kind of the challenge that I was facing a lot, you know, earlier days. And so it, it's disheartening, but just persistence, I think, was key in terms of being like, okay, that's great. I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to keep trying. Um, and I, I think that's been important throughout my journey. Um, I think, like, on the investing side, like, it's also been really helpful to find a champion within each place that I've been, right? Uh, whether it's getting my foot in the door or once I'm there, having someone to help support me in terms of growing within the firm. Um, and so, for instance, when I was first transitioning into venture, uh, from business school, I started at Intel Capital. I really, you know, I didn't have a background in tech. I didn't have a background as an operator. Uh, I was doing more later stage investing. And so to get someone to take a bet on me and see my potential was really important. And so that required me talking to, I'd say probably like 50 firms, uh, meeting different people, you know, getting a lot of no's, getting a lot of, oh, I don't think you're the right fit. Uh, but then, you know, you just you just need one person to believe in you. And so was able to uh, find a champion or two at Intel that really saw my potential, saw that, you know, I could bring something unique, a value proposition to their firm. Um, and so that was important in terms of getting my foot in venture. I think going forward, you know, places like AQTEL, et cetera, I found great mentors. Like Ellie was a mentor of mine uh, when I was at AQTEL, just in terms of helping navigate things like dealing with difficult boards. Because most of the time, the boards that I sat on, or not most, actually all of them, were all males. There, I was usually the only female. And so dealing with things like people not necessarily hearing what you're saying or mansplaining you. So, you know, I would say something and someone would just repeat that in their own words. <laughs> Um, how do you get your point across? How do you make sure your feedback is valued? I, I think like you definitely need a mentor uh, throughout that journey in terms of figuring out how to deal with those situations because sadly, like you might be the only female in the room like most of the time still. So you want to make sure that uh, you're getting good feedback in terms of being successful and not kind of being viewed as a diverse feedback but that you bring something to the table. And so I, I think that's been pretty important, just more of on the invested ones. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'd love to hear Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was fortunate to also have had a, a mentor, which is why I, I we believe that we need to mentor people like Div Div Divya, you know, when she competed with the 100 some people that that uh, applied for whatever career was. She's like way up here, so. So it's not that we, we didn't really have to mentor her that much, but, but my, my point being is, um, I do think there's there's a couple of things that I've seen about the women candidates. First off, historically, a lot of the female investors have gone towards more I call them not hard tech, okay? Mm -hmm. So consumer fashion, which is great and fine. Um, so so one of the things I've seen recently with Divya, whose case study was on quantum computers, um, is is more towards the deeper tech, the hardware. The, the things and actually being a female in that sector is a benefit because you will be remembered because you're not that new. So like Ilana Wisby, who is CEO of a quantum company, people remember her because she's sticking out for the crowd. So I think you use that to your benefit. And that was true for me. Because I was I you know, out of the forty or twenty some boards we like to sit on in retail, I was always the only female because these are really, really deep tech articles. Um, so, so I guess, you know, when I was younger, yes, they thought I was the secretary or the associate or the receptionist. That happened to me all the time. Uh, but I always, and also patients, 
definitely think that. And then, and then um, as I get older, I always find it amusing because then that much bigger comes and then they, this look of like, oh my God, she's actually the one who's evaluating me. And it's always fun for me. I have to say, I enjoy that. <laughs> so, um, and then more and more the, oh my God, she actually knows what red or, you know, GPUs and transistors and they work and they freak out about. So I, I, I say you always use that, right? It's okay to be a little person because you, do you remember? Do you surprise? Uh, and it will help your career, ultimately. That's fantastic contribution. Yeah. I want to add something, not with the investor hat, but with the, that community of half a million product managers. One of the trends that we're picking up on from you know, talking to that audience extensively is um, that the role of product in large corporations has dramatically increased. And as a result of that, a lot of uh, companies, a lot of Fortune 1000, have appointed chief product officer. Now, why it's relevant to this conversation is because women typically have made their way into the C-suite through HR, through marketing, sometimes through finance, but, but mostly positions that were you know, kind of subject to glassing. So you become chief HR officer and you're never going to go up to CEO from there. But when you're chief product officer, it's actually there are a number of studies, including some of ours, that say it's the best succession plan to become CEO next. And what we're finding is the backgrounds of chief product officers, it's actually a meritocracy more than almost any other function. So for example, 30% of the folks we surveyed this year are women, which means that you know that path is actually a path for more women to become CEO. And I found that really you know, inspiring and exciting because like kind of last, last cycle or last generation's battle was getting to the C-suite, the next battle for women is like, yeah, get the top role. And this is a path to big company CEO roles. That's a big reason to share. Now, in terms of you all are receiving a lot of pitches on a daily basis, female male doesn't really matter. But we have a lot of founders here uh, in the audience. What are some of your recommendations for, especially female founders, since it's a female panel, and um, female team panel, when they, when their nervousness kicks in, and then not feeling it up, really kicks in. What are some of your recommendations for our female founders and founders in general in the audience? It's Jeff, it works. So, uh, I think the first recommendation is um, don't think you're different. You are no different from I mean, any male founder or male CEO. You're just the same. So if, uh, if, if you go with that confidence, uh, what I have found in, even in hiring, just hiring, when I was uh, looking for senior level, senior level um, team, team members, women used to look at my requirements and they had to check mark every single requirement and only then they would apply. Whereas I would see a male candidate, he'd be probably checked in one requirement and he'd be he doesn't spot him. So that's the biggest difference I found in recruiting both men and women. Founders, women founders also feel that same way that, oh, I, I'm not good in financial analysis, so I probably need help on this. But that's, that's not the case. Nobody is an expert. And the VCs that you are talking to, they don't know better than you at all. So just don't, there should be no self-doubt. That would be my number one recommendation for any founder, especially for female founders, because I think women, um, women are raised to perfection in many ways. Okay, until and unless they are very, very good at something, they don't venture out, because they really want to be perfect. Whereas men are raised to taking risks. And this has been this has, research has been proven is how you how you raise boys and girls a little differently. It's changing, but the change it will, it will show up in different generation. But as but what we can do now is just don't don't have any self doubt. No, the investors don't know better than you. So when you're pitching, go with full confidence. The things you don't know, you just say you don't know this. But they don't know any better. Than you. So in the kind of if you, if you you think of the quality of entrepreneur pitches as a, a spectrum, you have sort of the, the middle where you have great guide pitching and 
uh, so great, and it, it's sort of a you know here, and then you have many women pitching worse than many of the guys for the reasons that you're mentioning. Don't know the numbers, not impressive enough. You know. But then the ones that figure out uh, how to get the job done, like they are the most assertive, the most confident, the most impressive, and in a in a negotiation they, they are the most demanding. And so I would say that once you understand how the game needs to be played, like essentially it's a complete battlefield. It's a total competition. There are winners, there are losers. You want to be on the side of the winners. I, I am yet to find someone who tells me they want to lose. Then, <laughs> um, then it's uh, you sort of like leapfrog to incredible focus, and and so that's that's what I'm seeing. Maybe offer a tactical tip. So what I've seen is obviously you have a spectrum, right? So some founders are very comfortable with their pitch, telling their story. They can tell the numbers, go deep in product, and so they're fine kind of going it alone come across really confident. If you're earlier in your journey of pitching VCs, a tactic I've seen um, some female founders and founders in general do is they'll bring in maybe other people from their team. So like someone who might know the numbers really well or can go deeper on the product. They won't necessarily defer to them, but I think just having them, you know, in the background, back pocket if need be to say, you know, this person can elaborate a bit more, just automatically gives you a boost of confidence, knowing that like it's not all on you in case you don't know the answer. There's always someone there to back you up. And so I see that be really effective um, across stages, but in particular, if you know, you're still early days in terms of pitching like a pre-seed or seed type startup, um, that's been really effective. So I'll give you more tactical information. Is I, I remember when I was trying to get my first job as a VC in 2002, it was had to go by all the partners and do a case study, 50 of us competing. And a good friend of mine said, I'm going to play you your theme song. Mm -hmm. So listen to a, your own theme song. It's kind of like when President Obama used to listen to that. And I'm right before he did speeches. So if you don't have one of those, get one. <laughs> and then before you pitch, just psych yourself up. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, to, and then and then have your song afterwards. Mm -hmm. you know, so well, <laughs> listen to that, um, or a movie to make yourself feel better. I can tell you personally, I love hidden figures. That's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> and so whenever something's not going well at work, or it didn't work, you know, we we pitched like 500 investors to get to our fund, and when it didn't work out, I would go watch the movie, and shake it off, and. Like Taylor Swift says, move on. So, so <laughs> that would be like practical advice. Yeah. I love that. And he was working on the floor before I did my pitches, and I, you know, I would get nervous. And especially having an accent would be even harder sometimes. And I would always visualize that my audience is my husband and my kids. And, you know, if, if they make fun, they make fun, but it's just like it made me feel comfortable at that point just visualizing that. And doing the pitch just like that, and that always works. I mean, I've pitched to now a bunch of billionaires, and they're just people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. so. <laughs> I know we don't have that much time left, and um, so I'd like to uh, ask you guys one last question. What is your favorite life lesson book, and how has it changed your life? I'm never done. Okay. Should I? Yeah. Um, I think I, I I like this particular quote is um, there are no failures in life it is only lessons and uh, that's kind of a mantra because <coughs> if you think of it uh, that way then it's easy to take it and it's, uh, the the better part is that it's you learn from it. so that's that's the whole goal is you are improving yourself so you don't make that same mistake that you make making it. But if you don't even consider a mistake, you think it's, it was a life lesson for you. It just makes you uh, keep going forward. I actually had a very similar one. So maybe just in the interest of time, it was you know the only thing that guarantees failure in life is to stop trying. And I think that's been very important to me. Whether it's you know trying for a new job or trying to get a new role, or even now when I'm trying to win over a startup that I want to invest in. Um, it's hard, right? Because you get a lot of no's along the way in life, and it's just learning how to deal with it, but then telling yourself to kind of pick yourself back up and keep going. Um, so, so mine is sort of twofold. So there's a serenity prayer, which is the, um, you know, yeah. 
change the things you can, accept the things you cannot, and have the wisdom to know the difference. That, that one I've always lived by since I was younger. But then on the, as a startup company, the, the one I would say is just don't have religion about anything. I mean, I will not sell services. I will not do this product. I will, you, you have to be adaptable. You know, if you're going to survive and your customer wants that, then you need to sell it to them. And, and where I've seen some founders just fail is like, we're never going to do that because we have to have our product be this way because this is our vision. Yes, but you're running out of cash and you can't raise it because we need to adapt and not have a religion about a specific thing, which is back to all of your points about cash matters, cash matters. If you're going to get cash out, okay, don't have a religion about that because that is something you can't change. Yeah. This for me, if I was going to use one sentence, it's uh, really, you are ready, right? Like, there's nothing to wait for, there's no hesitation to have, there's no fear. It's like right here, right now, and happening. Uh, thank you so much, Pat.